it's almost about that time. Right about now. Right about now. Funk, funk, funk. Funk, so brother. Brother, 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 brother. Devin Daniels, welcome to the Right About Now podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I am so thrilled to talk to you. The timing is good for me to talk to somebody like you because you've written a book. You've written two books now. Yes. I'm in the midst. I just started NaNoWriMo. Uh -huh, yes. NaNoWriMo. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And I am in hell because <laughs> I've written the first 3,000 words of a novel, which maybe will never see the light of day. But boy, <laughs> it always gives me like a new appreciation for people who actually have completed and written novels and actually gotten published twice. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me your origin story. Like, yes. how do you get to where you are now? As far as I can tell writer. you that I've never done NaNoWriMo. <laughs> okay. I was kind of hoping you'd say, yeah, my book was written in NaNoWriMo. Uh, no, I, I know that there are a lot of people out there, though, who have success doing that. Uh, I would say that the whole concept behind NaNoWriMo is just completely antithetical to how I write. I just, I am not like a word count person. Um, I don't, I don't even try to set like word count goals. It's just not how my brain functions. But <laughs> anyway. Um, how does your brain function? That's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah, in terms of my writing process, I'm very slow, um, methodical, and I'm editing as I go, which a lot of people, um, you know, don't do it that way. They they put out on paper what you would call a crappy first draft, right? Vomit and, draft. Vomit draft. And yeah. I, do not, I do not do that. I do not do that. Um, I am literally writing, you know, page one and I am, I am polishing it and perfecting it. And, and uh, it's like, I can't move on until it's completely readable. Now, of course, that doesn't mean I'm not jumping around and like putting ideas there. But in terms of like, you know, I can't keep going to the next chapter if I don't know how that conversation you know, occurred in, in the first chapter because it just, it won't make sense. And when I, when I wrote my first book, um, I made a mess really. I like, I kind of wrote all this stuff in, in no particular order, a bunch of different scenes. And then I essentially had to scrap it and start over because, you know, you can't just move around conversations and scenes because, you know, that conversation hasn't occurred yet. So I had to kind of reroute myself at that point. And now I write in chronological order, um, but I just do not have the ability to really move on unless it's very readable. Like, so basically when I finish a draft, it's almost like, I don't want to say in perfect form, but it's like a finished, you know, I can give it to someone and it's polished and it's readable. Um, so, I mean, I think that's kind of different though. And I, I don't necessarily recommend this. <laughs> because well, you know, It's really interesting. You're saying this because I'm the same way as you, like in <laughs> Additionally, I I'm like you, and maybe it's because I also have a background as an editor. I just can't help myself from editing yes. myself as I write, and I'm just constantly like, oh, I could rewrite that sentence. So I'm yes. trying this NaNoWriMo thing. It's definitely like a different way of doing it for me. I'm still, I will admit that I still go back and edit, even though <laughs> I'm supposed to. So it's probably taking me twice as long as it's supposed to take me. Yes. yes. Um, but I'm so it's refreshing to hear that somebody does it that way because yes. I thought that my way was like a really stupid slow. <laughs> It and then well, you know, here's the thing that I think is positive about it. And I've, I've had some people tell me, you know, one of the problems with doing it the way that I'm doing it is that you are uh, employing your both your right and your left brain at the same time. And you really shouldn't do that. Or it's more difficult if you do that, because, you know, you have your create creative brain, you need to let it kind of run amok, right, get stuff on the page, let it, you know, see where the story goes. And then your analytical brain, you know, where you're sitting there and you're um, dissecting each each word, you know, of the sentence, and you're rewriting the same sentence 200 times those things are kind of in conflict, right? And so because of that, you know, I'm writing very slowly. I mean, there are some people who can, you know, like I said, they set, they set a timer, a 20 minute timer. And they're like, I'm gonna race and like see how many words I can get. That is just, I, I can't even imagine doing such a thing. I'm like, why would I put a bunch of crap, you know, on the page that I'm just gonna have to immediately right. scrap and start These are over. the rewriters. These are the ones who are like, they, they love the rewrite. Yes, yes. And yeah. they're like excited to drive into their second draft. And I'm thinking, I'm done, <laughs> you know, when yeah. I finish my, my first, I mean, you know, obviously I'm not done. Yeah. There's editing. No, I know you, but yeah, it's clear, yeah. It's cleaner, I guess, than most people's first draft. Well, I'm like exactly. you, I'll tell you how this NaNoWriMo thing works out. I'm not sure I'm entitled really? to doing it correctly. Um, <laughs> but do you have an outline before you start a book or do you kind of go in as a pantser kind of like? So my outline is so bare bones. It's almost like not an outline at all. It's very pathetic. So I would say that I have in my mind and, and really written certain turning points and I might have ideas for scenes, but that's literally all we'll say, like, you know, scene at this location, 
and maybe at like, you know, this turning point, it's when, you know, he's going to tell her this, or she's, he's going to find out this or whatever. And I'm writing towards those turning points. And obviously with romance, you know, you're, you're trying to build the romantic tension. You're, you're building their relationship. You are, you know, each character is learning about the other, right? You have your two main characters and they're learning about and falling in love with the other. So it's, it's like, I don't really see that, that part very clearly. I'm, I, you know, once I'm writing, I'm kind of coming up with what the dialogue is going to be and how the, the relationship is sort of building. But I know that I'm working towards certain turning points, certain climactic, um, you know, parts that, that it's going to pivot the story, you know, or that, you know, one of the characters doesn't see coming. So that it's very bare bones though. Right. Right. Also something I, I, I like to hear because I'm not a big <laughs> liner. So can, yes. We should be writing partners. I think um, we should. I think we should. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I, I jumped ahead here. I still want to hear your origin okay, story. Okay. Yes. Origin story. So um, I have always been a, just a, a big nerdy reader since I was little and just voracious reader and anything I could get my hands on. Um, despite that, I never really considered becoming a writer. <laughs> um, I, when I was at USC, I majored in public relations and business. I mean, there's obviously writing, um, you know, in, in public relations and marketing. Um, but I just did, I, I don't think that even writing a book was on my radar. Now, while I was at USC, I was really interested in the, um, like being in the film program and the, the, the cinematic universe, you know, of what you see when you grow up in California. And I thought I would end up maybe doing something in that category. Right. Uh, now, fast forward, I got married and I started having kids. I'm in Maryland and I was, you know, kind of at a point where I was trying to decide what I was going to do next. And I'd always sort of had on my bucket list, well, maybe one day I'll write a book. And were it's you so doing marketing? Like, were you following that career? I, I did a variety of jobs. <laughs> um, I jumped around to a lot of different jobs. My husband is an entrepreneur, so we had a business. There was a lot of different things, but I, you know, was kind of at this crossroads of like, I can pick what I want to do next. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, you know, was like, I, you know, this bucket list item of writing a book, it always seemed real far off. And like, maybe I do it like when my kids are out of the house or I'm retired. And then I thought, well, you know, I got this baby here. Uh, I can't really do much leaving the house. This seems yeah. like maybe a good time. And my husband, who is just like the most supportive human in the world, I, you know, I, I kind of tell him like, I don't know, I'm kind of thinking about doing this. And immediately he's like, you should absolutely do that. You're going to, you would kill it at that, you know, blind faith in me, which I didn't really deserve. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, I just kind of started diving into it. And at that point I was like, well, what am I going to write? You know, and I, I actually had a document that I've been saving, you know, book or even screenplay ideas for a long time. So you can tell that like, it's been there in my head for, for, you know, Lord knows how long I, I've, it's been there, but I just hadn't really thought that it would be realistic to pursue. So, um, so anyway, this was back in about 2016 or so. And I decided, you know, I think I want to write a book that people would want to reread. Like they love it so much. They want to reread. And for me, uh, as a huge reader, I'm not really a huge uh, rereader though. And I thought, well, the only books I've ever reread are romantic comedies and rom-coms and romances. And it's kind of similar to, you know, the movies on TV that I just cannot flip past, right? If you see, right. if you catch it as you're scrolling, I'm like, I, I'm sucked in. I got to watch Sleepless in Seattle. I got to watch You've Got Me. I, can't, I physically can't turn. And those were TV. always the ones you were attracted to, the rom-coms. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just, I love the feeling of it. And I, you know, I, the, the the quick dialogue, you know, um, uh, just everything about it really spoke to me. And I thought, you know, those, those are the, the movies I like to rewatch and the books I like to reread. So that's what I'm going to, I'm going to try to do. Um, and at that point I, I kind of launched into it. I sort of was casting around for ideas and I thought, you know, what's sort of different and unique and, um, you know, hasn't been done to death, which is very challenging to find in the wow. romance genre. There's so wow. much out there. It's very saturated. Um, and at that point, of course, in 2016, what was going on around us, <laughs> there was um, all these stories in the news about people who were breaking up or uh, marriages were having problems because of this election and, and differences of opinion about who they were going to be voting for. Right. And I thought, you know, this just seems like a really interesting, timely, you know, meaty topic about how you might navigate, you know, uh, personal and, uh, uh, you know, politics and, and the differences right. and how that would, that would challenge your relationship. Um, and on top of it, I thought, you know, this is hard. This is like a hard topic to take on. Very hard. Very <laughs> polarizing, literally very, polarizing. Very polarizing. And I, you know, I am someone, I really just like to challenge myself. And I'm, I, if it seems hard and kind of scary to me, I'm like, yes, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to challenge myself with this. So that's what I did. And I, I wrote for, I started writing that book in 2017, kind of the tail end. I, I wrote all throughout 2018. 
I finished it basically uh, at the very end of 2018. And then in 2019, I was sort of like, well, now what do I do? <laughs> what do I do with yeah. it? Um, and that's when I, uh, you know, started looking for an agent. And again, I just had to really teach myself all of this. It wasn't yeah. like I, I didn't have really a foot in the world at all. Yeah, you weren't. Um, a, yeah, you didn't have yeah. any connections. You weren't really connected into the. In that no, world. no. I had one friend um, who was a published author, and she kind of uh, asked her a lot of questions, and um, but a different genre. So just you know, I, I I felt my way through it, and I you know was fortunate enough to find an agent who, um, you know, liked the story and felt confident about selling it. Um, and then went to, um, you know, put the book on submission, uh, basically the summer of 2019. And I was extremely fortunate, um, to have just really got an amazing reception to the book and, uh, uh, overnight had offers on the book. That's amazing. And I was shocked by it, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I've had some books out there and I, I've got, yeah, it's not to yeah. get just an overwhelming positive response. Yeah. Yeah. It's rare. It um, was yeah, it's, uh, you know, my agent said at the time, this was like a unicorn, you know, story, really, because it just, you know, I, I almost feel like I kind of, you know, fell backwards into this in some ways. Um, you know, a lot of people, yeah, you hear these stories about authors who have all these books in the drawer, you yeah. know, and I just didn't, I didn't have that experience. And I feel, you know, very lucky, obviously. <laughs> well, it's a great book. And and you're a, a good writer. And yeah, you're right. Timing is everything. I mean, you just mm -hmm. like you hit, you definitely hit a, a, a yes. spot. Um, yeah. So when you were writing this romance novel, were you, you had read so many, so would yes. you just have sort of instincts? Cause there's like, it's definitely a formula, right? Like, yes. like yes. I have a book by my desk. It's called uh, writing the romantic comedy. It's a really good book. I've, I've referred to it a lot of times, but it, you know, it gives you a whole, do you have the same thing? I need, I need to get the name of that book. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Hold it up. Who's the author of that? Uh, it's, uh, it is what's his name, writing the romantic myth by Billy Murnit, M-E-R-N-I-T. And I've, I've read this book. I had, it's like all earmarked and stuff because I also I love love romantic comedies a lot. Um, of oh. course it's more about yeah. writing romantic film, the screenplays, but yes. I think yes. apply the same rules to romance novels. I, I will yeah. admit, I've definitely not as, ex as, um, exposed to romance novels. I've read a few, yours, a few <laughs> other people have had on the show, uh, yes. but, uh, so, but did you like sort of inherently know the formula? Yes. Or the formula? yes. So, yeah. yeah. So I, there's a few things to me that is really important when you're writing romance. It's the tension and that you're building the tension appropriately. I, I like to write what's called slow burn romance, right? Where you're not, they're not getting together on the first page. They're getting together, you know, in the, the back third of the book. Right. And you know, the, as the reader, I, I almost want the reader screaming like, oh my gosh, just kiss already. Just get together already. Because I, I, I for me, the, the point of romance is really that anticipation, building that anticipation. Um, so that's one thing is, is the, um, the tension and also the pacing. Right, so that you're not giving it too much up front. You're, you know, the story's unfolding in such a way where the reader is finding out about these characters at the same time as they're finding out about each other. And I, I feel like the only way that you are able to accomplish this is if you do read a ton or, you know, watch a bunch of romantic comedy movies where you just have a sense of the rhythm, you yeah. know, of the story. And even like, you know, I probably the easiest thing for me and the thing I enjoy the most is writing dialogue. And it's because I can hear it. You know, I've watched these rom these rom coms so many times, millions of times, right? It's it's like I understand the rhythm of it, yeah. And it's it's easy for me to get to get that part because um, it's almost like I'm seeing it. You know, I'm watching it like a movie. And I I always get really excited when readers are like, oh, I feel like I'm watching this, or I feel like I'm in the room with these characters. I'm like, great, because that, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to accomplish, and that's how it is for me. It's like I'm I'm almost like I'm describing you know what I'm watching in my head. Um, but yeah, I do think that you know it. it I don't read actually a lot of um, craft books. In fact. I usually like fall asleep the second I start reading them. It's like, it's like, I, I know it in my bones, you know, but, yeah. um, but I, you know, I'm sure that the craft books would be, are, would be great for people, you know, who are trying to do this and maybe are feeling confused about it. But I think, you know, if you read just a, a ton of books in your genre, you automatically are going to like internalize those beats and you're going to know if something's not working, you know, that's for me is like, I, I know, okay, I've hit a point where, I you know, something big needs to happen here. Something needs to to kind of get the reader rocked back on their heels, a surprise, right? Um, or they expect, I, I need to drop a little carrot. Like, you know, even though they're not going to be together yet, I got to give them something, right? To to keep them, you know, flipping the pages. So I, I think it's a lot of fun. You know, the romance genre, 
and writing romance is is really unique I think you know every genre has its particular formula right a thriller would have a certain formula and you know historical fiction and all these different but I think the romance one is really interesting because a lot of times you don't even have you know a, a, a secondary plot you may not have a secondary plot it's really just these two characters in this relationship and that's very very difficult um you know I think romance sometimes gets a bad rap but it's really really hard to get a, a reader super invested in a couple um, and to come up with believable, realistic conflict. Yeah. What is it you think about this genre that you like so much? <laughs> it's, you know, and I think a lot of women could probably, um, you know, relate to this. It's like this giddy, swoony feeling, right? Yeah. And, you know, we, ha as, uh, speaking as a mom of four, right? Our, my day is very oh, filled with a lot of, yeah, four what, What's the rate? What's the age range? So the oldest is 15. I'm teaching okay. him to drive and fighting for my life. Okay. And then my youngest. I've got a 14 year old. I'm okay. It's, it's, I mean, it, oh. And an 18 year old who's, I'm by the way, applying to USC, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh my gosh. We'll definitely talk about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So I have 15, 14, 12, and eight. And, oh, wow. you know, my, yeah. So my, my days are, are, you know, full <laughs> like tasks. Right. And it's, and it's routine and it's exhausting work. And, I'm not really interested at the end of my day picking up some sort of serious or heavy book. I want something that's light, that's going to make me giggle, <laughs> um, <laughs> that makes me feel happy and swoony, or maybe, you know, make me feel a little bit more romantic towards my husband. I think all of these things really like uh, speak to, to women in particular, although my husband who, you know, had never really read a romance novel before I started writing, he's like, I, I feel like we've been missing out. You know, men are not told to read this, but this is like an instruction manual for women. And yeah. I, I even put kind of a line similar to that in this new book. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's kind yeah. of like, I used to, I used to work at men's magazines and uh -huh. some, one time a, a, a woman told me I was dating, said sometimes I read men's magazines just to understand the way men Yes. Yes, it's a good insight. It's probably just, it's the opposite with romance novels. Like this is but it's it's, ex it's exactly right. I mean, if you pick up a romance novel, you're automatically going to like you're going to be spoken to in a way that you're going to be able to glean all these insights um, about dating, about relationships, healthy communication, right? All these things that I, I feel like you know men are stumbling around <laughs> trying to figure out. But like here, here is all this you know information straight from you know the the brains of women. <laughs> exactly. What are some of the books that you? read over and over again or you said you reread a few books what are some that really inspired you i should look behind me right <laughs> yeah uh, you have a great little bookshelf there a lot of pink books which i think are probably yours right well that's mine yeah yeah um, <laughs> i you know so when i was growing up <laughs> yeah. i read, i was like um you know loved the babysitters club mm -hmm. then i got into um like fear street rl stein and christopher right. pike books then i got into danielle Steele. Uh, and Nora Roberts, yep. probably way, way before I should have. Then there was like a chick lit phase, you know, where you had stuff like uh, Bridget Jones's Diary or Sophie Kinsella right. books. Um, and I, I really like ran the whole gamut. Um, you know, I, I can't, I, of course I, I, you know, the Nicholas Sparks, you know, like those yeah. are all and like the movies that went along with it. Um, I just right. loved it. And I, and I, you know, can revisit those honestly, anytime, even the ones, you know, that I read when I was younger, I've, I've given some of them to like my daughter, who's, who's become a real reader too. And we just giggle about it. Um, yeah. With your daughter. Um, all right. So the rom-com, first of all, great. I, as a, uh, <laughs> as an editor or somebody who comes up to headlines all the time, I love yes. a good title. That's a really yes. good title. Did you Thank come up with that one? So, you know, it's so funny, uh, I, you know, titles are hard. Titles yeah, are really hard. hard. Yes, the title for my first book went through some changes. Um, and this one, I was like constantly racking my brain. And I actually started off with the title, How to Hook a Husband, okay? And that's, you know, the sort of the, the list of tips in the story. However, there was already a book uh, called How to Hook a Husband out oh, there. No. And, and I was, I was like devastated. <laughs> uh, and so I started, you know, kind of brainstorming it out. And I thought, one day I was sitting on my my son's uh, soccer field watching his practice and I'm going in my, I'm, you know, racking my brain thinking about it. And I thought, you know, this book is, it's a rom-com, but it's also like a rom-con, you know, cause she's conning him. And I thought that's a really, I could market the book like that, you know? Yeah. And I thought, no, I thought, no that's the title of the book. And I, it was like an epiphany, you know, yeah. and it, you're like, like you're, you have an adrenaline. I, and it wasn't used. I, I can't believe it. I was, I'm con, I was, shocking. you know, that I wouldn't tell anyone the title because I was terrified. I thought this is like this diamond that's been sitting here and people are just walking past it. Right. And, and not, 
not using yeah. this title. It's, I just think it's it's so good. And I was just terrified that someone was going to announce a book called The Wrong Con before, before I, I was able to you announce it. really good title. It's funny because yeah. the other day I was with my friend Ron, R-O-N, and he uh -huh. was telling me a story about his crazy dating life. He's like one of my only single friends. And I was like, that's a Ron com. I, like, I did a kind of reverse. Uh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Like, Nobody's ever thought of Ron com. You're right. That's that, a Ron com. It's, it's brilliant. You know, by, by the way, that's a movie idea right there. Yeah, like, right. I, so right. I, gotta, I, gotta, yeah. I might yeah. borrow that from you. Uh, <laughs> all right. So you write this book. It's a great story. Yeah. You mentioned, you. Uh, and we've got it there. You mentioned yeah. that, um, you know, I don't know. Could you, if, could yeah. you well, set it up yeah. a little, just a yeah, bit? I'll, I'll give the spiel. Give it so, the spiel. Yeah. So this idea was on my ideas list. Um, and I kind of was, you know, trying to figure out the second book with my editor and and she really liked this one. And I thought, okay, how am I going to tackle this? So here's the sort of the origin story is back in 2018, a woman uh, went to a garage sale and found a stack of magazines from the 1950s. And she decided to buy them. She brought them home. She was flipping through them at home. And she came across this article entitled 129 Ways to Get a Husband. Okay. It's from this. I, I got my Paul, hands on that, that is the greatest thing. I have a, a history with McCall's because the first job <laughs> I ever had, well, the first job I ever had was was at Child Magazine, which doesn't okay. matter, which was a parenting magazine. Which yes, is, yes. Was 21 years old working at a parenting magazine. <laughs> wouldn't have kids for another 15 years. But anyway, <laughs> uh, McCall's was upstairs. Um, okay. McCall's was upstairs. So I used to see the McCall's ladies. And the McCall's editors were very different than like the other editors. Uh -huh. I am was also in the building, which was a, uh -huh. a YM magazine, which like- a Yes, oh yes, oh yes. McCall's was a little more like, you know, they were definitely older, like for me- yes. They're like in their 40s. They were probably yes. in their 30s, but I thought they were in their 40s. But it was like a little more sophisticated. So yes. McCall's, yeah. So this magazine, McCall's. Or like, a, like a good housekeeping or a ladies' home yes. journal. Yes, it's the more for the married woman. Was also, family Circle was also, yes. was also in the building. This was the New York Times Magazine group, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, <laughs> but anyway, McCall's, I always remembered McCall's as being like, uh, it was definitely like it had a storied history. But it, uh -huh. yeah, but it was definitely for older people. Uh, yes. Kids, yes. Um, maybe like a step up from glamour, which was like, yes. which was yes. like early twenties. I mean, I, well, I, you know, made a point to get my hands on this magazine and I, I mean, I wish I could like show you through the screen, like flipping through it, how beautiful it is there. It's, beautiful it's magazine. like beautiful artwork, beautiful imagery. Like I, I, I'm like, I wish they made magazines like this. I mean, I, there's a, there's a, um, an editorial uh, Three Women of Courage by Senator John F. Kennedy. Okay, that's Thank one you. of the. I mean, is it? It's just so. Yeah. I, I just I, magazines. I, Don't get me started on magazines. I miss. I know. Them. We're gonna go off. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so she um, found this article in this magazine called "129 Ways to Get a Husband." It's so it's so funny. These these list of tips are just they're so funny. So she photographed all these tips, put it into a Facebook post, and the Facebook post went viral. Wow. And that is, of course, when I saw it, I saw it being you know, talked about somewhere, I ended up seeing the original post. But the really interesting thing about it is the comments on this post, which there are thousands, like 5,000 comments, okay? And, you know, some of the tips are really outlandish and, of course, very antiquated, very old-fashioned. But some of them are, are really insi insightful and, yeah. you know, um, really tap into sort of the the gender roles, you know, that sort of yeah. those universal truths, right, about the, about the genders. And so people are in the comments and they're laughing about it, but they're also kind of debating, you know, maybe, you know, like maybe we should be still using some of these or maybe I should try it. You know, they're tagging a friend. Have you ever tried this one? You know, and I thought this is so interesting to me. I love when I find um, you know, a, a, an idea that doesn't feel very black and white, like, it, you know, are some of these tips totally outdated? Yes. And are some of them, you know, still could work today? Also, yes. And I thought, well, what if a, you know, modern woman, you know, found this list of tips and was like, I'm going to test these suckers out, right, and see, you know, what works, and I'm going to do it on some poor unsuspecting, you know, guy. Um, and so that was really where the story kind of took shape was, okay, she's going to write, you know, it's just, and that's when like, sort of the tie in with like a how to lose a guy in 10 days, right? Yep. comes in, is, is she's a writer and she's looking for story ideas and like this is a really funny one where she's thinking to herself okay I'm going to totally make fun of this you know these are so silly and they're so old-fashioned and they don't hold water and her grandmother's like no I, I want you to try these ideas because they're going to work for you and they're you know this, the what worked in the 50s is can still work today 
And I loved that sort of, you know, old fashioned courtship with modern day dating and how do those two things meet in the middle. And so it just was so funny that I I knew immediately that I had kind of, um, you know, struck something because you you already know from just that bit that it's, this can go really, it can be really funny. The comedy is going to be there. And, you know, figuring out, you know, the hero and how to set him up into the story was also, you know, that was my next piece. And I thought, okay, I'm going to make it be, you know, sort of her, her rival at a, at a men's magazine who she can't stand. And she's going to, she's going to try to embarrass this guy and she's going to, you know, test out these tips. And then when he, you know, like totally falls for it, she's going to write this expose and sort of bring him down. And then of course, you know, he's not going to, he's not going to react the way that she thinks he will. And then, uh, you know, oh, oops, I actually like this guy. And now what am I going to do? <laughs> right. Um, I mean, it just, it writes itself and you did such yes. a great job distilling it. I, I love okay. it. I love the Thank idea. You. Thank um, you. And I, I, can we talk about this list for a minute? Because you got yes. me down the rabbit hole of this list. I, I caught <laughs> it up on my computer yeah. here. I mean, I, I'd love to hear some of the ones that stood out to you and that you incorporated in the book without giving so, away from so, the book. It's like, so first of all, with 129 tips, there's a ton to choose from. And then on top of it, I did a whole bunch of, you know, additional research and I found a lot of other lists as well. I mean, like, you know, women, especially who, you know, grown up reading these magazines, you, these lists are, are everywhere. Right. Yep. Uh, and so I, it was more like, how the heck am I going to distill down these like hundreds of tips <laughs> into this book? And, you know, how do I incorporate them in a way that's, you know, they organically fit the story. And it was hard because, you know, so many of these are just gold and you want to incorporate every single one of them. And, um, you know, I wasn't able to, so I was, <laughs> I just, um, so here, for example, um, read the obituaries to find eligible widowers. <laughs> that is unbelievable. <laughs> that is such a thing of the time. Like, right? can you right? imagine writing that today? I mean, you it's so. It, in five seconds, but yes, that is amazing. There, there was all these focus on widowers. Okay, go to all reunions of your high school or college class because there may be widowers there. <laughs> It's all about finding the widowers. Interesting. And then don't be afraid to associate with more attractive girls. They may have some leftovers. <laughs> that is the greatest thing. I mean, it's a so, so stumble when you walk into a room that he's in. I mean, that's that's one that I incorporated into the book in a in a meaningful way. Um, carry a hat box. Okay. I have a lot of questions <laughs> about carry a hat box. How is that gonna get a guy's attention? I don't know. Um, uh, people carried hat boxes, I guess, back then. I guess so. Um, 1950s, this was 1958. Um, this is the um, January 1958 issue. Um, wow. Okay, walk up to him and tell him you need some advice. Okay, that's one of the ones I'm like, yeah, that would totally work today. <laughs> I mean, you not a bad. It's I, a like, I like number 34, wear a Band-Aid. People always ask what happened. What happened? <laughs> I mean, it's so good. It's just dropping the handkerchief still works, right? This one was good. Stand in a corner and cry softly. Chances are good that he'll come over to find out what's wrong. Oh my God. These I mean, are hilarious. It's, there's too many good ones. Um, you know, if, how about this one? If there's a wallflower among the men you know, why not cultivate him? For all you know, he may be a diamond in the rough. Okay, I actually love that one, right? Yeah. Um, as, a, as someone who's, a, you know, a bookish introvert, right? That's, yep. a, that's a great thing to do. Um, so I just like, I, you know, you're reading this and you're, you're, it's like, how can I possibly incorporate all these, right? In, in, a, in a, a so much fun way. And so I really kind of just decided I'm going to write this story and I'm going to see, you know, which ones kind of fit in naturally. And of course, you know, some I'm like, I have to get in, um, don't whine because girls who whine stay on the vine. Right. I, I loved that. I was like, that's got to go. Also, wine stay on the vine. That's great. <laughs> so, you know, all of these things, I was like, how am I going to do this? And I, I printed out this list and, you know, when I, when I incorporated one, I would check it off and cross it off. Um, it just, it, yeah. And I was, it was kind of an organizational nightmare, you know, cause you're like, oh, I just, you know, I, I, I wrote this bit of dialogue where I could perfectly fit one in and I've already used it, you know, so then you're, you're, you know, all that. It, it was just a lot of fun to figure out how to do this. I felt like, I, like you said, like this, the concept kind of writes itself, right? You know, you know, even though you know what's going to happen, you're going to have a lot of fun getting there. <laughs> I mean, it's so fun. Yeah. And I, sh- I didn't mean to sort of that in some ways that diminishes what you do. No, no. Everybody can have a concept, but it's actually executed and make a good book is, is a yeah. whole thing. So it's a great <laughs> concept. Um, yeah. and, and, and you executed it perfectly. This okay. is, this is part of a genre called, enemies to lovers stories yes. 
Yes. Is that one of your favorite genres? Like absolutely. Like... Absolutely. So I think that every romance really has to have some enemies to lovers in it to, mm -hmm. um, to make it work, to be honest. Like, right. You can't have people just fall in love on the first page and then there's no conflict. Right. So like if, if you look at a movie, for example, like a You've Got Mail. OK, you've got, you know, Joe Fox. He's got the the big Barnes and Noble-esque store. And then you've got her, you know, Meg Ryan. She's got the the little indie store. So like these are their enemies from page one. Right. You know that like the, how are you going to bridge the gap between these two? Same idea with my first book with Meet You in the Middle. You've got a um, a Democrat staffer and a Republican staffer. And you're thinking, how the heck is this going to you know, how are they going to come together? James Carville um, and Mary Matt. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That was one of my models. Yeah. Sure, I so, yeah. So for this one. You know, I have, you know, she's she's writing for a, um, you know, a, a female driven, um, you know, digital media company. So, you know, my model for this was like a Refinery29 or a Bustle. Yeah. And then he uh, is actually the the founder, one of the co-founders of a rival men's site um, called Brawler, which was, of course, um, based on Barstool, Barstool Sports. I don't know yeah. if you were able to catch that. I'm oh, yeah. I'm I'm wondering, like, you know, are women going to going to catch this? I mean, it's pretty overt, <laughs> but you never know. Um, so and it's interesting that you chose publishing because I feel like, of course, that's a in the '90s, in the early 2000s, uh -huh. these rom rom coms were set in the New York sort of publishing world. Like they were always yes. the women always had jobs as editors at magazines. Of course, yes, yes. I read. Um, but but now I, it's interesting that now you chose because I I think of that as a time past that I kind of came up in. Yes, um, yes. But I guess it's still happening. It's just happening in a different uh, medium. It, 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 I think so. But once Maxim is now Barstool Sports, what was yeah. Barstool is now Refinery29. <laughs> exactly, right? It all it all kind oh. of evolves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I actually thought about setting the book in like the 90s or early 2000s because I felt like this very much feels like an early 2000s movie, you know, like sort of right. the How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days or... Um, 27 dresses or the ugly truth, you know, all the loud movies that were starring Katherine Heigl. Um, yeah, but I, I just, Heigl. <laughs> but yeah, I decided, yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. So for the, um, but for the, for the dating world, um, a lot has changed since the early two thousands. In fact, mm. you know, when I was, um, when I got married in 2005, um, uh, app dating, you know, this online dating world really barely existed if it existed right. at all. And I don't know anyone who did it, you know, now fast forward, um, you know, it's been basically 20 years. Um, you know, everyone is doing online dating. It's, it's, there's no stigma attached to it. Like there used to be, you know, right. and, and, like, oh, and we can tell that we met online. Yeah, exactly. Right. No, I know, I know many people who have gotten married from, from meeting online. So, um, I just felt like, you know, if we're going to juxtapose sort of the, the more uh, traditional or formal, um, courtship rituals of the fifties, right. we got, we got to really show the, the change now to this sort of online, um, much more casual, you know, that, um, so that is an interesting issue because that's come up for me. Um, I, you know, so a little bit of my history, just boring, yeah. I'll just give you that I kind of came up in the nineties in magazines, et cetera, early two thousands. And I actually was a, ro a relationship writer. I wrote, okay. I, wrote, I, I saw, I saw yeah. this and I'm okay. dying to hear about it. So you <laughs> answered the questions for Ask yeah, Cosmo. Yes. Yes. Cosmo or, Cosmo. or glam Glamour or something. I did yeah. both. So I, at Glamour yeah. was Jake, which was like a column where you just like, it was like, I would just come up with a topic. Like I remember I did one about third dates and I did one about, um, you yeah. know, why I hated Valentine's day, et cetera. <laughs> and then, uh, but, but then for Cosmo later in the two thousands, they would basically send me like five questions every month and then I would have to answer them. Uh, yeah. And it was, I was completely in it. Like I totally, now that my wife is a relationship therapist, like as a living, <laughs> living uh, I'm like, I can't believe that I was trusted. I, I did this. Yeah. Where, where did I have the goal to have? But you know, actually never. that's, that's really the, the best part about it though, is that you were an average, per, you know, you weren't a relationship expert and it's like, you know, ask an, an average, average guy, guy, right? Yeah. I'm an average guy, but I try, but I also knew enough to not be a total douchebag or yeah. that would all. So I kind of had to play a like balance between yeah. being honest, but also not just being a jerk. A jerk. Uh, yeah. No, not a misogynist. Not all jerk. guys are, yeah, not all guys are. I mean, I knew obviously a lot of those kinds of guys, but I could yeah. I guess because I'm uh, whatever, a fairly decent guy, I could kind of tap into that. But I also yeah. knew the jerk type guy. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so um, I forgot where I was going with this. One thing that, that I thought of when I saw that McCall's list is like, I got to know how, I mean, I don't know if you know the history. Do you know anything about the history of how that list was even written? Because So I actually it does. It gives an introduduction. Oh, yeah. um, and what do they say? Yeah. Hey, hang on, hang on. It's, so I'm gonna have... it's, like a, it's like a relic from a different era, but it's- It's, it's, so, it's so funny, okay? Um, 
uh, 16 people took part in McCall's brainstorming session on how to find a husband. I can totally see them sitting around like the conference table. Uh, it, and they have, they have the pictures. Avenue. And it says oh, they, they were have... they were chosen largely because they were known to have good minds, lively ideas, and mature experience. Right. Uh, like among the friends. among the members of the panel were a popular songwriter, a marriage consultant, an airline stewardess, a police commissioner, a housewife, an investment banker, a psychologist, a bachelor, a newlywed, and an engineer. Okay, a, well, yeah. it, it's so funny. It goes on, and it and it and it. Okay, gives, so they did it. They definitely put a lot more, or at least ostensibly put a lot more sort of because normally that list would have been basically everybody's got to meet in the conference room and we're going <laughs> to brainstorm ideas and somebody's yeah. got to board and we're just like yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah or you have a writer who basically comes up with the first draft and then everybody adds to it all the ideas. right right well it always made me laugh like why a 129 it's such an odd number and so for the book i decided to make it 125 because it was just i'm like but I, i'm glad so you did an odd number because that's a little secret of list is that um uh, when you do uh, uh, even numbers are sound too pat. People prefer they seem more real when you do odd numbers because like 101 yeah, rather 101 than 100. Is yeah. than 100. It's just 100 it's sounds funny. like like a pat thing, but 101 sounds like you know you're getting a bonus one, and also it just sounds more <laughs> real. So I always did odd numbers. Psychology of this, I love it. Yeah, it's, there's a psychology about odd numbers. So 129 was definitely per on purpose. They, I'm sure they could have come up with 130. <laughs> right. been, just, the police just one more. probably had one more idea oh gosh oh man all right yeah. so that was cool so i i yeah so that uh, that was a little bit of my background so i was totally fascinated with that, that you that you because i've thought about setting books in this era among men yes but i but this also okay this leads to my question that i was thinking of yeah. um when i'm thinking about writing about relationships today it's so even though i wrote about relationships in the 90s and early 2000s like you said it has changed so oh. much I've got two kids. I'm not dating. I have right. one friend who's dating, so I could, you know, ask him questions. But, um, you know, most of my friends are married or divorced, whatever. Like, yes, yeah. So I sometimes feel intimidated writing about this because there's just it's different now. It's very different. Yeah. And even though you're you're a lot younger than I am, did you sort of have some concerns? Like, I don't. I'm not really up on the dating scene. Like, you know, right. it's true. Like, there are. You know, I think as a writer, you have to sort of just put that stuff aside. You know, like, what? I don't have. You don't have to have a certain experience to be able to write something. Right. You, know, you just ha you have to imagine. And I think, you know, I have. Ha I'm 41, but I have had friends who have only gotten married in the last few years. 41. That's amazing. Sorry. <laughs> Is that young? It feels really old. Um, but you know, I, I, you know, I have like a 15 year old kid, but I have friends who are having babies right now. So I actually am you know, pretty up with like, you know, the, the things that they're, you know, doing now, yeah. even though for me, I haven't really, like I said, I haven't been part of the dating world in, you know, 20 years. Um, I, I read a lot. I, I watch a lot. And I think I can get a sense of like what it's like to, um, you know, be on a dating app or like, you know, the, the concept of like, you know, another, another person's just a swipe away, you know, whereas I think, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you, I think you took maybe dating a little bit more seriously, or you gave people maybe a little bit more of a chance, more time. Um, and I, I feel like it would be really hard. It would be really hard to be in this dating world. I, I hear a lot of horror stories, you know, when you do a lot of research and you start digging into like, well, what's it like to be, um, you know, in, on dating apps, it's so horrible, you know, it sounds horrible to me. Sounds horrible. I, I, <laughs> I, mean, I have a friend who, He's like just because of his height, he barely he never gets swipes. Like, oh gosh, like it's so sad. Oh like, my gosh, it's like, so sad. Okay, men are superficial. And you like, see, like, you see why people lie because it's yeah. like you just want to at least get to the date part that's of it, and, you know? Part, right. And that's that's so hard. And it's like you know, back in our back in my day or your day, it's like that's that's just not how things were done, right? You you more often um, met someone in person, right? You you had a connection to them. Line um, dates and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, yeah. Like bar. Although I, 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 do people even meet in bars anymore? Yeah. It's very <laughs> interesting. I just did a, a interview with a woman who does, um, d writes about generation, generational differences. And oh. she said, like, this generation, so Gen Z, which our kids yeah. are basically, yeah. Um, you know, everything is happening at a much slower rate. So, like, even the generation, like, you're, a, I guess, a millennial, like, yeah. They're dating much later. Oh, I know. They even drive as you. They don't. Like, they don't want to drive. Like they don't no, want to get. Don't the drive. So everything is like a little bit, um, because things. I guess because they live longer. I don't. I forgot exactly why she explained this. Is why this is yeah. happening. But so like things are happening slower. People don't. You know, like by the time I got to out of college, I had had a lot of girlfriends. Like I had like, yeah. some of the, some people don't even haven't even really dated in college. Like it's, they're. It's, 
it's so interesting to me. And I, I see the, the differences in my own kids, you know, and the things I, that like I was kind of anxious to do and I was anxious to get out of the house. And now you hear that like kids don't want to leave the house. Right. Um, they, they don't want to move out. And I'm like, it's so strange to me. Like I would never have wanted to move back in with my parents. I, after I, was, like a nightmare. I was like, the first thing I want to do is get out of my get house. Out. Uh, get, get out. I, I literally, I think I got my driver's, you know, permit, like the day I was the in the day, house. the day, you know, I I'm happy to say that my, my son, like he wants his license. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> and even if he, even if he didn't, I would force him because I'm so desperate for driving help. <laughs> but, um, right. yeah. I, I, I see this though. And I have nieces and nephews and I see that with them too. It's very strange to me. Uh, it's hard to understand. I, I think maybe there's just so many creature comforts today um, that we never had, um, we never experienced. And the, the sort of, I say to my kids, it's this instant gratification culture that they don't understand. They really don't understand. I'm like, you know, back in our day, if I loved a TV show, I had to wait, you know, a week uh, to be able to see that next episode, or I had to wait all summer long. And now you can binge, you know, eight seasons of shows in, you know, no time at all. Um, you get you get six episodes drop and you can just watch them straight Media through. Gratification. Yeah. Right. And you can you can you know, if I wanted to hear a song, I had to wait by my stereo and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, press play and record on my stereo to tape it. Right. And then, you know, yeah, and that exactly. you get to hear, yeah. And now you can just say, hey, Alexa, play me, you know, whatever. So this concept of like this instant gratification and not really having to wait for anything, I feel like it's, it all kind of contributes to this, this like really comfortable, they just have, they have everything they want at their fingertips that we just didn't have. Right. And I guess, listen, I don't want to be one of those people who's like, this generation doesn't understand, <laughs> you know, like Archie Bunker, but I just, it's, it is weird. Like it just feels weird. weird. Um, yeah. It's different. Yeah. So how old are the people, the, the protagonists in your, in your book? Like what you put them so, in? So I kind of try to have a sweet spot um, where I, I like to go closer to 30. Um, and I, I, I set my uh, first book as like, he's like 30. I think maybe she's 27 and he's 30. And why is that? Cause you just feel like you understand. I, I like, I would, I don't want to go like right after college. Mm -hmm. Um, because I don't think people have a lot of experience at that, at that time. And I, I like for this book, you know, the idea is that she's, she's frustrated because all of her friends are getting married and, you know, starting to have kids and they're kind of dropping out, right. Dropping out of her life. And I have certainly experienced that in my own life. I mean, I was one of the first to get married and I had friends who were upset with me because, you know, I, I drop out as soon as I, you know, have kids and it's really hard to find the time to do these things. And so I wanted to write it from the other perspective though, when you feel like you're being left behind essentially. And you know, she's sort of on the eve of her 30th birthday and she's seeing like all of her friends are kind of paired off and she sort of feels like she's, she's falling behind and like, you know, how is she going to meet someone? How does this go? And, you know, the, with the dating world being what it is, when you're real frustrated, you start to just, you know, ask yourself a lot of these tough questions. Right. Um, so I just, I kind of like that, that 30 year old, yeah. um, you know, you're not, you're no, not cynical. No you're not you are 30, but you're yeah. still, you're still beginning. Yeah. Uh, you're still young as, but, you as know. relationships. It's like, that's right. You no, know. yeah, that's no, that's a good sweet spot for sure. Yeah. You, I know that you, um, that you don't do a lot of outlining and pre-planning before you write, but do you, uh, think, think through the characters? Like, do you do like character sketches or anything? <laughs> I wish I could say I did <laughs> because I have, I have printed out, you know, the character profile things mm -hmm. and then I can't fill it out because I'm like, I don't know this person. I'm not just going to say, they like this or they like that. Sort and of then, know them as you're writing them, right? Yeah. So yeah. I I always like say to people when I'm talking about writing, like I am finding out about these characters the same way that you're, you know, as you're reading about them. That's my same timeline is like, I'm starting to give little details about them and their, their personalities are taking shape. And I, I think then, you know, like their hobbies, their likes, their favorite foods, the way they dress is starting to, to then crystallize yeah. for Later, me. Later you could probably fill out that, those tags, right? Well, yes, at the I end. <laughs> yeah, you know everything about them. You know everything. And well, I'm I like, love I, that. I love that you're saying yeah. that. Yeah. I all this kind of pre, you're right. All this pre thing, it's just a lot of guessing. Like, uh, how do you know yeah. until, until you write it? Like, I it's don't. It's so hard. It's it's really hard. And also, you know, what if you start writing it and you're like, that this doesn't feel like them, right? Or yeah. um, I think it's, it's easier at the end if you're like, okay, I know exactly if this character would say this or not. And you might want to change something or you might want to bring in more of that type of language or something. Now, certainly if you were writing a very specific trope, like if you were writing, you know, shy, shy, quiet, introvert girl and like, you know, extroverted guy, you, you would need to start, you know, <laughs> with, yeah. with certain behaviors. However, I'm not really doing that. You know, I'm, I'm more situational. I'm coming up with my concept. It's less about 
the, the personalities, I guess. I don't know if I'm describing yeah, that. No, well. I understand what you're saying. And the only thing, so how do you, you know, so one of your guy, one of the character, like you said, he's kind of like a arrogant, uh, mm -hmm. you know, annoying, egotistical. Yes. Actor. But that yeah. Yeah, to, to not fall into a cliche with that, like, what do you, yes. how do you, how do you find, how do you root it in some reality that feels like it's not going to be? Totally. Fun? So I, this is a really interesting question and I'm glad you asked it because I feel like in romance, a lot of times you're hit over the head with like, this is the character, this is, you know, they, they have to be, they have to, ha their decisions have to fit inside this box. I don't like to do that. I don't like to be stuck in a box. I like to leave some mystery on the page. I like for their decisions to be a little more subtle. So like, as an example, um, in some of the reviews that I've read so far of this book, people don't feel like my hero has atoned enough for his um, involvement in this company that he built yeah. and that, you know, has this misogynistic content. Well, I, that was very purposeful on my right. part. I don't believe that a man who has built a um, really successful company, um, who's been focused on growing that company, that I don't believe he feel, feel sorry for, for, for yeah. you know, working hard for 10 years and, you know, and making a lot of money at that company. However, I do think that he might take that experience and evolve as a person for how he behaves in the future. And that's what I tried to show um, towards the end of the book. And also in the epilogue, you're seeing what he's doing later. Um, I, I just feel it, that it's very um, uh, inauthentic, not genuine, um, that a guy would be like, oh, I'm so sorry for all of this that I've, that I've done to wrong you that you're upset about. I, 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 that to me, I feel like that realistic aspect is what I want to bring to this, right? Men yeah. sometimes do and say misogynistic things, right? <laughs> Some of their work may not be, um, you know, something that I think is is great or the way that they speak or some of their past decisions, right? They might not be perfect, right? Um, imperfect characters to me, uh, morally gray, are, are just way more interesting to write. And I don't want to- hit... The last, you know- Yes. Over the... I, don't wanna, I don't want to hit people over the head with like, oh, this guy has, you know, he's made he's up for, he's, yeah. he's come full circle. And now he's made he's, up yeah, now he's yeah. working at a, at, a, at a homeless shelter. And, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's that's yeah. sometimes what it feels like you're expected to do, honestly, in this yeah. romance genre. And I, I really uh, push back against that. Yeah. Um, you know, characters, a, a story like that to me is boring. Mm -hmm. And also it's not realistic. You know, characters are messy. They make bad decisions. They make imperfect choices. Um, you know, how we, how we react and behave, um, in a fight, for example, um, you know, I'm not proud of some of the things I've said, <laughs> right. When I've, when I've been in an argument in the heat of the moment and, um, to, to, to pretend that, you know, you're not going to say anything offensive, um, in those situations is, is just, is disingenuous. So I think if, if, that's not what you're going to get from my books, I guess, is, is you're going to get something that's a little more subtle and maybe you, you're going to, you know, be left to sort of uh, piece together. Okay. I, I see how this character has evolved, even if, you know, I didn't hit you over the head with it. And yet there's certain expectations that people have when, go, when going into a reading a romance uh, novel or going to watching a rom-com and one of yeah. them is a happy ending, right? Like can yes. you infer from the happy ending? You really can't. You cannot. So uh, <laughs> in the romance genre, it, it, this is the, the the contract that you have with the reader, right? Is happily yeah. ever after or happy for now, meaning if you're reading like a young adult book um, and, you know, they're not maybe going to get married right at the end, but, but they're going to be together and, and go into the yeah. sunset. Um, if you if you break that uh, that covenant with the reader, you you are not. First of all, it's no longer characterized as a romance. Um, it, that would be like in a general fiction category. But yeah. romance readers in particular, okay, are are specifically picking romance because they want to know that it's going to work out nicely in the end, yeah. and and that's that's the um, the confidence that they want to have. And you know, I can read any sort of conflict, and it's and it feels like oh my gosh, this couple's never going to get together. But I know that going in that they are. And people use romance, um, you know, like I said, like as a, as like a comfort tool, or like if they have a really um, you know challenging, like as an example, I know someone who she works as a hospice nurse. She says, I have such a heavy day, right? That you're dealing with literal death, like all day long. I need something light and happy. And I need to know that's what I'm getting, right? To be able to reset. And I, I take that really seriously. You know, certainly um, if you don't want to have a, a happily ever after and you want you want to write something that's where the romance, um, like a, a good example would be, I don't know if you've read this book or watched the movie, um, One Day. It starred um, Anne Hathaway. Oh, uh, right. 
I haven't, I, I haven't, but I, now I want to see it. Okay. Or like a Nicholas Sparks. This is yeah. another, yeah, someone's, always, someone's always dying in the end. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that's t technically it cannot be classified as a romance. That's a fiction novel with romantic elements. Um, right. I think it's a little bit um, not graceful because the the reader or maybe the end user don't always understand that classification. And some people will make a mistake and say, this is a romance. And then they give it to someone. They're like, excuse me, like this, this person just died. <laughs> it's yeah, not, yeah. Did not sign up for a death at the end. Yeah, exactly. Um, what are some other what are some other contracts you have with the reader in the romance genre? Um, so for me, this is this is also kind of a soapbox thing, but for for to be classified as a rom com, and right now rom coms are very popular, okay, in the romance genre, and I, this is not the fault of of authors. It's definitely um, you know something that publishers do is you know they jump on this train, right? Rom coms are selling, so everything's going to be classified as a rom com. Okay, no, if you do not have very specific comedic elements to your story. I don't think it should be classified as a rom-com. So for me, that means funny dialogue, right? I'm 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 trying to make you laugh out loud with you know the the banter back and forth, yeah. um, funny situations. So yeah. like in in the rom-com where they go out on the double date with her uh, sister and her brother-in-law, it goes off the rails, right? Like that's you know funny situations, and then also a funny uh, internal monologue. So just the the voice um, of the narrator. Um, in, in this case, you know, my, uh, my heroine Cassidy, right, is, is you're amused, right, seeing how she's kind of um, uh, processing what's going on around her. So those are like, for me, it's those yeah. three elements. And I'm like, you know, if you're going to pick up my book, I want you to know that that's what you're getting, you know. That's so great. Wow, this is great. I, I love talking to you, especially kind of where I am right now, because I, I will confess that what I'm writing, it, it feels like a rom-com, but I'm not okay. sure where it's going because I'm like you, I'm just kind of writing. Yes, seeing how uh, it goes, I, yeah. I have, a, I have a basic concept, which I can't okay. share, but it's, maybe I can start with you <laughs> off. Uh, cause yeah. I love yes, I was gonna say, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, but, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, no, it's so, it's so helpful. And I, um, let me see, last question. Okay, I always just like to ask, uh, you know, writers who have had success, you know, what yet they wish they knew, you know, what they know now that they kind of wish they knew when they were just starting. Um, this is a really hard industry. And I think there's this sense when you're writing and you finished your book and you've gotten an agent that like, once you get this deal, it's going to be great, right? Once you see your book on the shelf, it's going to be awesome. And like, that's your big dream. And you're going to, you're going to walk into Barnes and Noble, you're going to see that book there. And it's, it's all great. It's not all, it's not all great. <laughs> it's not all great. And, you know, you keep raising the bar a little bit. Well, okay, I'm on the shelf, but I didn't sell as many copies as the person next to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, okay, I, I have good reviews, but that person has better reviews or, um, you know, I got this, this, uh, opportunity and, but that person is, you know, got this, this, uh, you know, press article on this bigger website, you know, so there's all these things where you're constantly sort of in a comparison game or like, why, why, you know, is my book not as successful as that person's over there when I'm, I'm certain that mine is better. Right. Yeah, of course, always. <laughs> um, so I, and also there's just a lot of, um, there's the, the publishing industry in general is changing extremely rapidly. And I think what used to be sort of this brass ring of being a traditionally published author is, is really in flux. Um, you know, self-publishing has, has taken, a, you know, yeah. much more successful than it used to be. Um, a ton of people are having a lot of success doing that. You know, you have something like uh, book talk, right. On TikTok that's coming in and sort of, I don't want to even say le leveling the playing field, but it's just like, it's, it's, everyone's kind of desperately trying to figure out how to get their book to go viral on TikTok. It's just, there's a lot of things that I didn't know that were going to be coming along <laughs> with the, with the, the idea of just, here's your published book. Yeah. What, what, what do you do social media wise to oh. promote your book? <laughs> <laughs> promote your career. It's, yeah. I mean, it's brutal. You have to do a lot. And in fact, you know, that's one of the things I think was a bit of a surprise to me is just how much is on my shoulders. Um, you know, when you sign with a traditional publisher, you think like, oh, I'm getting this huge marketing machine. I mean, not, not really, but, you know, everyone yeah. out there is, is kind of doing the same thing. We're all on Instagram. Um, you know, I have a presence basically on all social media channels. I focus mostly on Instagram, which I think is where a lot of the readers are. Um, I do some stuff on TikTok now because I feel like I, I don't have a choice really. Um, it, it's hard though, because that's very, very time consuming. I think your time is better spent writing books, Probably. but also, but also you want to be interacting with your readers and people love interacting with m me and other authors. And, um, I think it's really cool that like they will finish the book and they'll immediately write me this long, you know, uh, instant message, um, 
gosh, that shows my age, direct message on uh, Instagram. And I, you know, and they can get a response from me, you know, very quickly. Can you imagine back in the day, writing Nicholas Sparks or, you know. Like, no, right. Yeah, it's, exactly, it's, right. It's great. I, I read so many books. I never even considered, you know, writing a, a fan letter or whatever to an author. And now it's, it's just as simple as someone opening up an app and, and shooting a message out. Right. Um, and I want, you know, and I want people who take the time to do that to, to feel valued. And so you do, you spend a lot of time kind of interacting with people and trying to engage with people. And um, it's, 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 it can be tiring, you know, it can be tiring and you can feel like you're, you could spend all day doing that. Right. And not writing if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. There's so much to, to think about. It is not easy being a writer. You're, you really just have to to love writing or at least yeah. there has to be something because I don't know why. I was going to say like sometimes people talk about loving writing and I'm like, I, I don't really think writing. I was no, going to say, I don't, I don't think I could ever say I love writing. You have to be driven by something because otherwise, why would you subject yourself to there's, this torture? There's this, there's this, um, you know, saying about how people, they don't love writing, but they love having written, Right. I like and I, that. and I feel like I, I identify with that. <laughs> I'm totally there. I love <laughs> looking at the thing after it's done, but the, yes. after, which is why NaNoWriMo is, big yes. big, because it's a lot of the process. I think that's great. It's motivating. You know, it, it holds you. I, I, I got to do it because otherwise I would never do it. I've got three jobs. I'm, you know, <laughs> yeah. thankfully I have a, a great accountability partner. Um, So we're just like constantly writing each other. Like, how many did you do? You know, it's like, I, I sort of need that because otherwise I just never would do it. Like, to yes. Me, at my stage in my life, to not have a deadline, to not have somebody paying me to do something, it's hard. I, I just very hard. Yeah, it's very hard. And to not uh, know the outcome. Yeah, and to not know the outcome. Just I hate uh, ambiguity. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a leap of faith. <laughs> well, you did it. A few I times. did. And